Yep, that's me. 13 years ago, watching Sandra Bullock win the Academy Award for The Blind Side. The night was completely surreal. Two of my favorite things in the world, Bullock and the Oscars, coming together in one amazing night. The video of me freaking out went viral on YouTube, getting over 100,000 views in just a matter of days, and then I was featured on Inside Edition. Check this out. It's easy to get carried away watching a big awards show like the Oscars, but frankly, we have never seen anything like this. A Sandra Bullock fan who literally freaked out when she won Best Actress. I remember the interview lasting like 30 minutes, but the only piece of it they showed was this. Two of my favorite things are Sandra Bullock and the Academy Awards. So what you see on the video is 100% real. And then I especially love what Deborah Norville said at the end of the segment. Brian says his Sandra Bullock obsession started 16 years ago when he saw Bullock in the hit movie Speed. He was nine at the time. We'll be back with more Inside Edition after this. That truly was a crazy week. As a Sandra Bullock super fan going back to 1994, I never really thought she'd find herself in the Oscar conversation, let alone get a nomination, let alone manage a victory on Hollywood's biggest night. The 2010 award season was so much fun. Watching Bullock take home one trophy after another, be featured in countless interviews and on endless magazine covers, after her most eventful year ever in the movies, 2009 giving us the romantic comedy hit The Proposal in June, the abysmal so-called comedy All About Steve in September, and the runaway blockbuster sports drama The Blind Side in November, Sandra Bullock was officially at the top of the A-list like never before and commanding more attention as a performer than she had since the mid-1990s. And the Academy Award, a prize that she'd never really pursued as an actor, was suddenly within her reach. But was there a chance at a surprise upset at the Oscars in 2010? Sandra Bullock did not sweep the season by any means. She won Best Actress in a Motion Picture Drama at the Golden Globes, and she took the SAG Award for Female Actor in a Leading Role, but she tied for Best Actress at the Critics' Choice Awards, and she wasn't even nominated at the BAFTA Awards. Who else could have won over Bullock that year? Some might argue Carey Mulligan had a slim chance after her BAFTA victory, but the person I would argue who came closer to snatching the gold trophy for Best Actress that year was the one and only Meryl Streep on her 16th Oscar nomination for her dazzling performance in Nora Ephron's final film, Julie and Julia, playing the iconic Julia Child. Streep had lost the Oscar in 2003 for Adaptation, in 2007 for The Devil Wears Prada, in 2009 for Doubt. It was time. Hell, it was way past time. Streep had won two Academy Awards early in her career, one for Kramer vs. Kramer in 1980, the second for Sophie's Choice in 1983, the latter my choice for the best acting Oscar win of all time. But no matter how astonishing her performance is in Sophie's Choice, Streep had been great in countless other films since, in the 1980s, in the 1990s, in the 2000s. Just look at her output in 2008 and 2009. Mamma Mia, Doubt, Julie and Julia, and It's Complicated. Just wonderfully varied and challenging performances through and through. The overdue narrative was growing to be sure, and I bet you Meryl Streep got closer to an Oscar win for Julie and Julia than most people think. So why didn't she win? Why did Sandra Bullock ultimately take the Best Actress Academy Award for The Blind Side? Oh my god, we're actually here! We've made it to the video I've been most excited to make since I launched this channel in 2021. Sandra vs. Meryl. Sit back, relax, you know the drill. In this video, we're talking the spectacular Best Actress race of 2010 and why Sandra Bullock defeated Meryl Streep. Before we get to the nominees, let's talk about the ceremony itself. The 82nd Academy Awards on March 7, 2010, let's be honest, only had a couple surprises and noteworthy moments. Alec Baldwin and Steve Martin co-hosted the event, and they did just fine, although I do love all the attention they give to Meryl Streep, their co-star from It's Complicated. Anyone who has ever worked with Meryl Streep always ends up saying the exact same thing. Can that woman act, and what's up with all the Hitler memorabilia? <laughs> The Academy brought back the format I love from the previous year of having people on stage give a short speech to each of the nominated actors, although this time it wasn't necessarily people who'd won Oscars before, and so for me at least, that took some of the magic out of the moment. Something people might not remember is that before Baldwin and Martin float down from the ceiling, 
the five nominees for Best Actor and the five nominees for Best Actress were revealed on stage arm in arm, their names announced one by one before they're escorted to their seats. It might have sounded like a good idea on paper, but it comes off as awkward in the moment. Same for the Neil Patrick Harris opening number, which might have worked better if he was the Oscar host that year, but as a lead-in to Baldwin and Martin's monologue, it was a case of too much at once. One segment I loved, however, was the tribute to John Hughes, who passed away in the summer of 2009. Hughes wrote and directed three of my favorite films, The Breakfast Club, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, but he'd never been nominated for an Oscar, and so the Academy could have just featured him for like two seconds in the In Memoriam segment and called it a day. Instead, they gave him a six-minute tribute with an opening by Molly Ringwald and Matthew Broderick, a lovely montage of clips and interviews, and words of remembrance from more actors who appeared in his films before the reveal of Hughes' family in the audience. This was a beautiful gesture by the Academy toward a filmmaker who didn't win very many awards, but always made us laugh and cut through to our hearts. When it came to the award wins, not many categories offered suspense. Up won Best Animated Feature, Pixar's third film in three years to win the category, Avatar won some technical awards, as expected, and The Hurt Locker took Best Editing, Original Screenplay, Director for Catherine Bigelow, and Best Picture, as expected. The most monumental part of the night, of course, was Bigelow becoming the first woman ever to win the Best Director Oscar a moment that has thankfully been repeated more than once in recent years. Best Director in 2010 was especially fascinating because Bigelow's closest competitor was her former husband James Cameron for Avatar, but more on that Oscar race and the careers of those two influential artists next month. In Best Supporting Actor, Christoph Waltz swept the season for his breakthrough villainous performance in Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, winning at the Golden Globes, Critics' Choice, SAG, and BAFTA, before taking the Oscar. Everyone else in this category was just happy to be there, except for Stanley Tucci maybe, who didn't appear too happy to be nominated for The Lovely Bones. I mean, come on, Academy! His charming performance in Julie and Julia opposite Meryl Streep was right there. Even more predictable, I would say, was Monique taking Best Supporting Actress for her astonishing performance in Precious. Like Vaults, Monique swept every major award show, not missing anywhere. In Best Actor, it didn't look like anyone could upset Jeff Bridges for Crazy Heart, despite his movie not getting into Best Picture, and despite everyone else in the category giving bold and tremendous performances, especially Colin Firth in A Single Man and Jeremy Renner in The Hurt Locker, but this was Bridges' fifth nomination after 40 years in the industry, and Academy voters decided it was just his time for a turn that, sadly, I don't think has stayed in many of our memories. The only major prize Bridges lost was BAFTA, where Firth won. Seriously, that to me is his all-timer performance, a single man my favorite film of 2009, but by Oscar night, Bridges had that gold trophy in the bag. I loved what his fabulous Baker Boys co-star Michelle Pfeiffer had to say to him when presenting his nomination, and I adored Bridges' speech. Now, let's get to Best Actress, which Sandra Bullock had a very good shot in winning, but I would argue, unlike the other three acting categories, she didn't have this in the bag necessarily. Who had a slight chance in beating Bullock, and who was just happy to be there? I would say the nominee in the category who had zero shot in a win was Helen Mirren, nominated for her performance in The Last Station, which tells the story of famed novelist Leo Tolstoy, played by Christopher Plummer, who was also an Oscar nominee that night for Best Supporting Actor. Mirren played the wife of Tolstoy, who's fighting for the rights to her husband's literary legacy upon his death. You are a stone-hearted bitch of a daughter. <laughs> I lost five children! Why couldn't one of them have been you? Mirren was the runaway frontrunner for the Best Actress Oscar three years prior for The Queen, despite that category in 2007 being one of the best in Academy history. I mean, seriously, just stunning performances from all five women, any of whom could have won. In early 2010, Helen Mirren's nomination for Best Actress was the win itself, partly because she missed at both Critics' Choice and BAFTA, but mostly because her movie, The Last Station, just didn't make much of an impact overall, receiving lukewarm reviews and only making $6 million at the U.S. box office. She's terrific in the film, but I would have loved the fifth Best Actress spot that year to go to the never-nominated Abby Cornish for her exquisite performance in Jane Campion's Bright Star. 
Next up is Gabourey Sidibe, who gives a raw and emotionally devastating turn as the title role in Precious, playing an abused teenager pregnant with her second child who enrolls in an alternative school to better her life. Mother ain't done nothing for me. Beat me. Rape me. Call me an animal. Make me feel worthless. Directed by Lee Daniels and co-starring Monique, Paula Patton, and Mariah Carey, Precious was a giant hit with critics and audiences following its premiere at the 2009 Sundance Film Festival. The film played at Cannes and at Toronto, the buzz building slowly throughout the year until it finally hit theaters in November. Precious is so powerful that it was always going to play a role during awards season and it overperformed in every way, showing up at all the big precursor ceremonies and receiving six Oscar nominations, including Best Picture and Best Director. Jeffrey Fletcher won the Best Adapted Screenplay Academy Award, and Monique was, as I said before, the runaway favorite to take Best Supporting Actress. So I guess you could argue that Gabourey Sidibe had a small chance to win Best Actress, given her film's popularity, especially with awards voters, but her main struggle was in winning things. She kept showing up, never missing, at Golden Globes, Critics' Choice, SAG, BAFTA, and the Oscars, but the truth of the matter was that she was very new onto the scene, and it was going to be difficult to overtake seasoned veterans like Sandra Bullock and Meryl Streep. Also, only one woman of color had ever taken the Best Actress trophy at the Oscars, Halle Berry for Monsters Ball, and so sadly, that factor likely played a role too, but oh my god, what an amazing Oscar victory Gabourey Sidibe would have been for Precious. Just a flat-out all-timer. It's probably the best performance in the category, honestly. And thus, I'm happy she did get a few wins that season, like at the Black Reel Awards, the NAACP Image Awards, and the Film Independent Spirit Awards, where the late Philip Seymour Hoffman called her name, Sidibe giving an excellent speech. I'd like to thank uh, my fellow actors who taught me had I, really, I showed up not knowing anything. I still hardly know anything. I'm gonna call all those chicks up for, for my next role. Another fantastic Best Actress nominee from that year was Carrie Mulligan for the superb drama and education, a coming of age story set in 1960s London about the relationship between a teenage girl and a playboy nearly twice her age. And I never did anything before I met you. And sometimes I think no one's ever done anything in this whole stupid country, apart from you. Carrie Mulligan had been in a few projects before, but her role as Jenny in an education was her major breakthrough, just an outstanding piece of film acting that showed the world everything Mulligan was made of. Her undeniably compelling turn, like Gabourey Sidibe's, showed up at every major precursor ceremony, and then she took home one big trophy, the BAFTA Award for Best Actress, Mickey Rourke, the previous year's Best Actor BAFTA winner for The Wrestler announced Mulligan as the winner, and she said some lovely words on stage. I'd like to thank uh, Nick Hornby for writing such a brilliant character. Um, it's such a gift. Now, An Education is a very British film, so I wouldn't say Mulligan's win at BAFTA was a monumentally surprising one, but still, as we grew closer to the Oscar ceremony, her victory in a category that the Oscar frontrunner Sandra Bullock wasn't even nominated in, showed that Mulligan had some momentum in that final stretch. I wonder if BAFTA had happened more than two weeks before the Academy Awards, if she could have been a spoiler, but I think by the end of February, her BAFTA win was too little too late. Also, like Sidibe, Mulligan was very new to the cinema scene and was going to struggle beating out the other better known talent in her category, especially at the Oscars. Mulligan has done tremendous work in film since, and she received a second Oscar nomination in 2021 for her delicious turn in Promising Young Woman. So, to recap, Helen Mirren had zero chance in winning, Gabrielle Sidibe had almost no chance, Carrie Mulligan had just the slightest chance. Was there anyone who was able to take down the frontrunner Sandra Bullock? I would argue that in early 2010, the only actress who could have beaten Bullock was the beloved Meryl Streep who was on her 16th Oscar nomination for her divine performance in the lovely and entertaining Julie and Julia, co-starring Amy Adams and Stanley Tucci. Cutting back and forth between Julia Child beginning her cooking career in Paris and Julie Powell challenging herself to blog her way through Child's cookbook, Nora Ephron's project was the ultimate food movie for a director who'd made food such an important part to all of her classic romantic comedies, 
like when Harry met Sally and you've got mail. Julie and Julia is just so much fun. And at the heart of the movie is the winning Meryl Streep performance, one of her best, bringing to life Julia Child in a way you can't not love. Do you know how to bone a deck? No, but that's exactly the sort of thing that I'm very interested in learning how to do. She's charming, funny, sexual, confident. You don't see the slightest trace of the character Streep had just played in Mamma Mia and Doubt. This was an entirely new creation that showed even more of her endless versatility. The award season started well for Meryl Streep at both the Critics' Choice Awards and the Golden Globe Awards. At Critics' Choice, Streep was announced as the winner for Best Actress for Julie and Julia, but in a tie, the second winner in the category turned out to be Sandra Bullock for The Blind Side. Now, if you thought I was completely nuts upon seeing Bullock's Oscar win, you should have seen me the night of January 15th, 2010, when I watched my two favorite actresses tie in a major awards category, humorously play up their rivalry on stage, and then run to each other and kiss. Like, let me tell you, my 25-year-old gay self couldn't really handle it. That was an insane few minutes I will never forget as long as I live. And then in the press room later, Streep was super complimentary of Bullock's work and her talent, saying this. I really admired especially Sandra's work this year. There are things that look effortless, easy, that are the hardest things in the world to do, just to have charm. This woman has it in spades. Their Critics' Choice Awards tie didn't exactly clear things up as to whom had frontrunner status in Best Actress, and neither did their wins in separate categories at the Golden Globes two nights later. Sandra Bullock won the Golden Globe Award for Best Actress in a motion picture drama, as expected, and she gave, as expected, a terrific speech. Please don't let Ricky Gervais be right. Do I need to thank whoever bought this for me? Because, um, kidding. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Hollywood Foreign Press, after all these years, and um, you let me step over to the other side. And then Meryl Streep was double nominated in the Best Actress in a Motion Picture Comedy or Musical category for both Julie and Julia, which had come out in August, and It's Complicated, the Nancy Myers romantic comedy, that had come out in December. It's Complicated is a fun romp with a great cast and beautiful kitchens, but the more memorable character Street played of the two was for sure Julia Child in Julie and Julia, so it wasn't a surprise when Colin Farrell announced her name and that film, as is always the case with Streep, especially at the Globes, her speech was a great one. I want to change my name to T-Bone. <laughs> T-Bone Streep. <laughs> I think it sounds good. It should be noted that in this category, Streep beat out her main Oscar competitor, Sandra Bullock, not for the blind side, mind you, but for the proposal. You might forget that Bullock was also double nominated at the Golden Globes that night, but let's be honest, she was never beating out Streep for her turn in the summer romantic comedy co-starring Ryan Reynolds. Bullock was even up for, and won, trophies for her third 2009 release at a different ceremony, but more on that in a minute. With a couple of big wins at the beginning of the award season for Julie and Julia, did Meryl Streep have a chance at finally winning her third Academy Award? The two big things that kept her chances near the top, I'd say, were playing a real-life character, which the Academy always loves, and the fact that Streep hadn't won an Oscar since 1983 for Sophie's Choice. It was absolutely time to give her another trophy. She almost won the year before for her tremendous dramatic performance in Doubt, losing only because the also overdue Kate Winslet was in her category for the reader. Going into Oscars night 2010, the only person who could beat Meryl Streep was Sandra Bullock. Even though Bullock was only on her first Oscar nomination, while Streep was on her 16th, so why did Bullock ultimately win the Best Actress Oscar over Streep? Here are the top five reasons. The first and most important reason is that Sandra Bullock, while she might not have been overdue for an Oscar win, was one of the most beloved and charismatic actresses in Hollywood who everybody was ready and willing to hand awards to. She just needed to find that perfect character and vehicle to do it for her. The Blind Side, of course, was it. This movie came at the right time for Bullock, following her summer hit The Proposal and showing a new side to the actress we hadn't really seen before. Her performance as Leanne Tui showing new shades to her screen persona and dramatic talent. Telling the real-life story of Michael Orr, a homeless teenager who later became a first-round NFL draft pick, Bullock stands out front and center 
with the wildly determined and outspoken mother who brings Michael into her family. Oh, and Sean says all the pro athletes use futons if they can't find a bed big enough, so I got you one of those. Of course, the frame was heinous. It's not about to let that in my house, but I got you something nicer. This role needed a movie star, and although Bullock declined the role for many months, only agreeing to it after meeting Leanne for the first time, she was absolutely the perfect choice. Bullock apparently struggled finding her way into the character that first week of filming, as she talked about on The Charlie Rowe Show. I could not figure it out. Couldn't gel. Nothing clicked. It was hot. I was not good. It was literally a scene that should have taken maybe 30 minutes to shoot, went on to like three hours. And I, I literally got in the car and I said, I've made a huge mistake. And I don't know how I'm going to get through the next three months. Um, and we're all going to be miserable. <laughs> But eventually she found her groove, the physical look to her character importance, her accent pitch perfect, her many dramatic beats landing well for the viewer. She gets her showstopper moments, like when she's on the field and compares Michael's football team to his family, and when she confronts the gang members who've made Michael's life a living hell. Was it the greatest performance of the year? No. Is it Sandra Bullock's best performance? Again, no. But maybe more than ever before, Bullock brought charisma and confidence to her role that could have been maudlin or awkward if played by someone else, Bullock made this role her own and awards voters noticed. It was pretty much the first time award voters had taken Bullock seriously, her only trophies before 2010 coming from places like the Teen Choice Awards or the MTV Movie Awards. Nothing she'd made before The Blind Side got her any kind of serious Oscar buzz, although she did receive Golden Globe Award nominations for While You Were Sleeping in 1996 and Miss Congeniality in 2001, and she shared the SAG Ensemble Prize in 2006 for Crash, which went on to win the Best Picture Oscar. I think the one performance she did before The Blind Side that deserved an Oscar nomination was in the drama biopic Infamous as the real life Harper Lee, but that film struggled in the shadows of 2005's Capote, which had done so well at the Oscars a few months before Infamous came out. I always wonder if the release dates of Capote and Infamous had been flipped, what might have happened? They might have ignored Bullock for Infamous, which bombed hard at the box office, but they weren't going to ignore her for the hugely successful The Blind Side, because the second reason she won was the crazy amount of money The Blind Side earned at the end of 2009 and in early 2010, cementing Bullock's status as one of the biggest box office draws in the industry. She had shown in the previous summers the proposal that she could still pack in audiences in the romantic comedy genre, and then with The Blind Side, she showed that audiences would come to the theater in droves, no matter what genre she was in. People loved Sandra Bullock, they loved the story she was telling, and they showed up. If The Blind Side had just done okay in box office revenue, I don't think Bullock wins the Oscar for Best Actress. I think this is a rare year in which huge and kind of unexpected blockbuster numbers for a movie significantly helped win someone an acting Oscar. Bullock had been doing good and great work in a variety of popular movies for 15 years, starting with the hit action movie Speed in 1994, going into her first big rom-com While You Were Sleeping in 1995, and then the John Grisham adaptation of Time to Kill in 1996. In the early 2000s, her comedies Miss Congeniality and Two Weeks Notice both did well, and then she showed off her dramatic chops in Crash and Infamous. An Oscar vehicle for Bullock seemed possible, and once the blind side marched past the $250 million mark, in just the United States alone, the Oscar suddenly became Bullock's to lose. You and Meryl Streep, who was also nominated, have mm -hmm. had this uh, competition, this yes. pretend, maybe it's not so pretend. Maybe it's not. Yes. You know Meryl. Yeah. And mm. if Meryl wins, what will you say to her? I'm gonna beat the out of her. <laughs> the third reason was that she just didn't have a lot of competition in the best actors category that year. And yes, I'm including Meryl Streep. Helen Mirren had just won an Oscar for The Queen and didn't have any momentum for The Last Station. Gabourey Sidibe and Kerry Mulligan were two young actors who didn't have a lot of credits on their resumes, and I doubt they gave Bullock much competition for the Academy Award win. Streep is really the only person I could have seen beating her, but in my mind there were five huge marks against Streep this time around. Ready? Here we go. Number one, Julie and Julia had come out back in August and it wasn't fresh in anyone's minds, like The Blind Side, which played in theaters all throughout award season. Number two, Julie and Julia was a comedy with some drama in it too, but it's oftentimes, let's be honest, a light comedy. Those kinds of movies make it difficult to win an acting Oscar. Number three, Julie and Julia didn't receive a single Oscar nomination in any other category. 
Number four, and this is a big one, Streep is only in half the movie. If the whole film had been about Julia Child and Streep was in almost every scene, she might have won the Best Actress Oscar, but it's really only half her story, the good story, whereas the other half about Julie Powell, played by Amy Adams, is only entertaining in fits and starts. And then number five, and this is key as well, Meryl Streep lost the SAG Award for Best Actress to Sandra Bullock. We've seen time and time again how important that SAG win is. I think part of the reason Streep might have lost at SAG was that she had just won there the year before for Doubt, but still, Bullock winning over Streep showed the momentum shifting to Bullock in those crucial final weeks before the Oscars. Streep needed that SAG victory to stay afloat and still be a viable contender to win the Academy Award on March 7th. I still believe Streep was in second place, but I'm not even sure if she came close to Bullock in the final tally vote. This lack of major competition helped Bullock big time. I mean, just imagine if she had been nominated a year before or a year later. There's no way Sandra Bullock beats out Kate Winslet for the Oscar, and there's no way she beats out Natalie Portman. This was the case of perfect timing for Bullock to ensure an Oscar victory. The fourth reason Sandra Bullock took home the gold trophy is that the blind side received a surprise Best Picture nod on Oscar nominations morning, which got a huge cheer in the press room. The blind side nominees to be determined. And which showed there was a lot of strength for the movie from the Academy beyond the Bullock performance. Now to be fair, that was the only other Oscar nomination the blind side received. Even an education made it into a third category, Best Adapted Screenplay. But as we talk about on this channel time and time again, a Best Picture nomination is often a huge help to scoring an acting Oscar win. Bullock probably would have won here without that nod in Best Picture, but it was just another piece of the puzzle that tipped the scale in her favor, especially since Meryl Streep's film, Julie and Julia, did not get into Best Picture. Did you know this was an Oscar? No. Then I would have said yes right from the beginning. <laughs> I need my Oscar. Problem. I shall take this part. <laughs> well, now, do you need your Oscar? No. no. Yes, you I do. thought in Speed 2, I had it clenched. <laughs> I had you? it in the bag. I'm still baffled by the events that sort of have transpired in the last two months. The huge success of the film and, yeah, and the being nominated the being and nominated now being a front and, runner and all of that. Yeah, the whole front runner. It's so funny. You know, I just go, if Meryl was in here, or Gabby, they'd <laughs> yes. be a front runner too. It's like, it's an interesting machine. I, I, you don't have to worry about this. You're only up against Meryl Streep. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> and the fifth and final reason is that Sandra Bullock just simply dominated that award season from beginning to end in a way few actors have before or since. This was her moment. She won Favorite Movie Actress at the People's Choice Awards. She tied with Meryl Streep at Critics' Choice. She was double nominated at Golden Globes, winning for The Blind Side. She won the SAG Award. She was nominated for an NAACP Image Award. Hell, she won the Razzie Award for Worst Actress for her very annoying performance in All About Steve. And she showed up the night before the Oscars to accept her trophy, the good sport Bullock always is. They said no one went to go see this film, but I know that there's over 700 members here. And if I won, that means the majority of the 700 had to have voted, so that means 352. She was everywhere, doing every interview, every round table, making every appearance possible. And despite her not getting in a BAFTA, it just by Oscar night was a foregone conclusion. Sandra Bullock was winning the Academy Award. I knew in my heart that Sean Penn was going to call her name, but I still freaked out anyway. Like I seriously have never freaked out in my entire life. This was it for me. My favorite actress finally nominated for and winning an Academy Award. Her speech is quite simply an all timer. I love how she acknowledged the four other women in her category and I love what she says about her mother, Helga, who died in 2000. If I can take this moment to thank Helga B um, for not letting me write in cards with boys till I was 18 because she was right, I would have done what she said I was going to do. Meryl Streep looked so happy for Sandra Bullock that night, and thankfully she didn't have to wait too much longer before she finally received her third Oscar win two years later for The Iron Lady, Bullock looking on from the audience. And then two years after that, Bullock and Streep had a Best Actress rematch at the Academy Awards. Bullock up for Gravity, Streep up for August Osage County, the two of them plus Judi Dench and Amy Adams losing to Kate Blanchett for Blue Jasmine. For more on that fascinating race, head on over to the Brian Rowe Video Patreon, where I dive deep into Bullock's chances at a second Oscar win for Alfonso Cuaron's masterful space thriller, which went home that night with seven Academy Awards 
including Best Director. Yep, this exclusive video is already here. Sandra vs. Kate vs. Amy, Best Actress 2014, now available on the Patreon. You can find the link in the description below. Occasionally you see Bullock and Streep bump into each other at Oscar events. It happened the night Streep won for the Iron Lady, and it happened just a few years ago when Streep was there for the post. I'm not sure if Bullock will receive a third Oscar nomination in the years to come. Her career has quieted down in the last decade, Bullock only appearing in a film here and there. Although she's still wildly popular with audiences, her most recent film The Lost City, a hit at the box office, as a massive fan of hers, I know we'll never get the crazy whirlwind of Best Actress 2010 again, that wonderful time of watching Bullock collect trophies left and right, but we can always remember, we can always look back, and we can always continue hitting the ground and screaming for joy and leaning into the intense love so many of us have for the great Sandra Bullock and the wonderful, glorious Academy Awards. Thanks so much for watching! If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to head on over to the Patreon page where I have that exclusive new video all about the Best Actress Race of 2014, Sandra vs. Kate vs. Amy. It's at patreon.com slash Brian Rowe video. We'll see you next time.